Good morning. Welcome to our online service this morning. Thank you for taking the time and making the space to join with us as we gather to worship God, to praise God together, to pray together, to hear his word for us today. It's great to have you with us this morning as we gather. I want to take just a moment at the start of our time together to say a very genuine thank you to the band who've done a great job of recording our praise. It's wonderful to be able to hear ourselves being led by ourselves in worship. It's a wonderful thing. It's a real blessing and many of you have commented to me and other people who have fed it back that that's something that's really appreciated. So I wanted to just publicly thank the band for that. But I also want to thank Matthew McLaughlin and Chris McCann who are really part of the behind the scenes putting together the videos and uploading those and, and the rest of the media committee then also for sharing um, the links online to make sure that you can you can watch this there's a whole team of people working and it's really appreciated we really do appreciate your skills and abilities to be able to enable us to worship it's really appreciated I realize you may not like um, being singled out or named um, but it is important that we're able to give thanks and appreciate your skills and abilities um, thank you very much I want to just flag with you that this evening on, on Sunday we will be gathering again and resuming our Zoom prayer meeting at 8 o'clock. And if you're looking for the link to that, David Johnson will have that. And we'll be beginning that for the next season of Church Life. So we'll be thrilled if you would join with us for that. But let me bring us into worship in our minds and in our heads and increase our awareness of who we are as we gather as God's people. Psalm 47 clearly says, Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to God, sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth. Sing to him a psalm of praise. We're going to do that now. We're going to sing together where you are. We encourage you to sing and join along um, as we gather in one voice in different places, scattered but gathered together as God's people. We're going to have a kids talk from Elaine. Timothy is doing our reading this week and we appreciate both of them for that. Thank you so much. And now, let us worship God.
I'm sure by this stage you're all back to school. Some of you may, may just have started in P1, some of you may be oh as old as the P7s and you'll be back to school where things are just not quite the same. Yes, the building's the same, probably the teachers are all the same, but you probably have to sanitise your hands as soon as you walk through the door and as well as that you probably have to wash your hands lots of times in the classroom. But we're back to the roots of our learning, where we learn to read, where we learn to write, and where we learn to do lots of hard sums. So lots of our learning is done in school. We have our roots in school. Some other things have roots as well, and I'm sure you will recognize this. It's a plant, and plants have roots as well. If they didn't have roots, they wouldn't have these lovely green stems. The roots of the plant reach down into the soil where you probably know they absorb water and they also get nutrients or lots of good things from the soil that help them to grow. If the plants didn't have water, if they didn't have nutrients, if they didn't have the air that God gives us all around, they wouldn't grow and they wouldn't flourish. We also have roots in our families. How do we know we're loved? Well, sometimes if you fall and cut your knee, mum or dad might come along and give you a great big hug just to comfort you. As well as that, mums and dads care for us because they organise all the shopping and all the food that we eat. They wash all the clothes that we wear. They iron the clothes that we wear. And they buy us lots of things to get ready for school, for holidays, Christmas time and for birthdays. So we 
know that we are loved in our families and we have roots. We have people there who care for us. It's the same as in church. The church isn't really the building and the bricks that make the building. The church is the people, the people in the church who love and care for you. We can show how we care for each other by doing simple things. Maybe sending someone a little card, maybe sending someone a text or phoning someone just to ask to see how they are and maybe offering to do something to help them. Remember, even though we can't meet up, many of us think about you and pray for you and hope that we'll be able to see you in the near future. The reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 to 21. I am reading from the New International Version of the Bible. The section is entitled, A Prayer for the Ephesians, starting at verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, for ever and ever. Amen. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Timothy, for reading for us. I wonder if you ever get distracted in prayer. I wonder if you ever go off on a tangent. Do you think of, or you're praying for a friend or family member and as you're thinking of them, you maybe think about the last time you saw them, which is maybe in a coffee shop or somewhere. And then you're thinking about coffee shops and you think about cake and then you're just thinking about cake for a moment. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, I wasn't um, doing what I was doing a moment ago. In Ephesians chapter three, in verse one, Paul begins a thought and then he steps out of it to describe what we looked at last week and then in verse 14 where we are this week he comes back to his original thought he's praying for power for the local church i think it's on one hand gives us some relief in terms of our own life because paul mirrors how our minds work in the bible we get distracted or we think of other things to think about or even pray about and then we come back to our original thought and so paul brings us back to this section where he is praying for power for the people in the local church. In Paul's era, it's in Ephesus, and in ours, we will try to apply this in Gling only. That will be our application this morning to consider Paul's prayer for our lives. Paul prays this powerful prayer, really, that's all around power. And as we consider 2020, one of the words you could use to describe this year would be powerless. We feel powerless this year. In March, life changed unrecognizably. We could not have predicted our work, family, social, leisure life changing the way that it has this year. We feel powerless in the face of an invisible virus. We're sanitizing our hands, we're wearing masks, we're obeying the rules about how many people can gather and where they can gather. But actually, in the realm of something we can't see, we're doing our best, but we don't have power over it. And so I think this prayer that Paul prays has particular value for us in this season. Paul begins by writing that he is kneeling in prayer. This is a little bit unusual because the Jewish practice would have been to stand to pray. And you see that in the images in the current world at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem where people are standing facing the wall. People at this time stood to pray. But whenever they were passionate or really deeply desiring something, then they knelt so King Solomon knelt at the dedication of the temple in 2 Chronicles. Jesus lay on the ground in Gethsemane, and we read about that in Mark 14. And even James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James, or was thought to read the book of James, or to write the book of James, James was known as Camel Knees, because he was also known as being somebody who spent so much time in prayer that it affected his anatomy. 
Paul is praying here in this heightened passion for the local church. I think it's because he personally knows what it is to have what he's praying for and he wants the church to also have it. He is generously wanting them to have the same experience of Jesus and knowledge of Jesus as he has. I'd love to encourage you this morning, just as an aside, to develop that intentionality in prayer. Maybe you start a little prayer list. Maybe a list of people who are important to you in this moment and you just commit to praying for them on a habitual, ongoing basis in your life. It's interesting what comes to the fore when you sit with that. It's a wonderful thing also if you have a season of life of struggle and a friend or, or acquaintance or a member of the church family turns to you and says, I'm going to add you to my prayer list. I'm going to add you to the list of people on my list and commit to praying for you. You can only do that if you have the habit and the, and the, the routine of committing to pray for the people who are important to you and what's happening in the world. So just, I'd encourage you to do that. You can do it on something fancy and you can just grab a sheet of paper and make a list of the names of the people and the circumstances in their life that you want to see God have input in, to take control of, to have breakthrough in. I'd encourage you to have that little bit of intentionality around that. But Paul brings the local church before Father God in prayer and it's from God that we find our place and name. We find our place as we've been reading and learning about ultimately and being part of God's family. That's our, our primary identity. It's not in our flag or our culture or our nationality. It's actually found as the gathered people of God because God is making a new humanity of people from all over the world who become part of his church, who become part of his family. God's gift and bringing us into his family isn't a, I'll tolerate you, I'll put up with you, but a welcoming in to actually have the full inheritance that even Jesus will have. That's the picture that we have in the Bible. We will be full inheritors of everything that God wants us to have. And so we see here that Paul prays power, that they would know provision, that they would know God's strength through the Holy Spirit in their inner being, in their inner humanity. So much in our modern world tells us you can be whatever you want to be, wherever you want to do it. You have the power within you to achieve and have whatever you wish. But that's not actually Christian. In our faith, the power comes from God out of his glorious riches. He is in abundance. It's not a scarce resource. It's not a well where God has given to others. And when it comes to you, the well is dry. That is not how God gives to us. God gives out of his riches for us. God has the ability, but also the desire that we would know and experience and live out of his power. The end result isn't that we become spiritual supermen or superwomen with lots of power running about in the world. Paul prays that we will know this power in our inner being so that Christ will dwell in our hearts through faith. It's done because we believe and trust Jesus, but what happens is that Christ, through the Holy Spirit, dwells in us. This is mighty scripture. This is incredible good news for us today. So Paul is praying that God will strengthen our inner lives so that Christ will be able to dwell in us. I wonder if you've ever gone to the spa or the local corner store. Other corner stores are available. But it's a wet day and you're in the shop and you're getting some bread and milk and eggs. And you don't have your bag for life, your reusable bag. So you buy the this, the thin bag in the shop. And if you've been unlucky, and this may be me speaking from personal experience, you've been unlucky to buy the eggs, or the only ones they have are the eggs in the hard plastic container. And so you're on your walk home with your bag, and unknown to you, that hard plastic container has come against the carrier bag, and it's slowly sliding. Really, your first awareness generally is when you're walking along the road, and you realize that you're carrying a bag that has become incredibly light. Because what has happened is the bag was not strong enough to hold what was on the inside and everything just lands up on the road. The carrier was not strong enough for what it would be used for. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, if you believe who he is as the Son of God, who came, lived, died and rose again for you, if you trust him, if your belief is, is that and you trust Jesus with your life because of that and you follow him, you find here this incredible prayer for strength for our inner lives so that Christ will dwell in our hearts, so that God will move 
into us and inhabit us. A couple of things that I think are important for you to see. What this word really means is that Christ settles into your heart. This isn't a hotel break or Airbnb or Christ will visit like the in-laws or like kids coming home at Christmas for a couple of days or home in the summer for a couple of days. This is the permanent dwelling place. That's what this refers to. Sometimes I think we miss that. It's like Christ dwells in my heart at times. That's not what we find here. What the Bible describes of is of God moving into his people. God dwells permanently. He's not a lodger. He takes up residence within us. It's an incredible piece of good news, but it also changes where your power comes from in life. I find that interesting that Paul prays for strength in our inner being because of this. That in our personhood, we are strong enough on the inside for Christ to be able to move in. Maybe this is the prayer for you to pray today. What Paul is doing here is asking God to use his Holy Spirit's power to help these local Christians to be fully who they are made to be. God's plan is to inhabit his people. That there would be closeness and intimacy, but also he would be where they draw their strength for life from. To be clear with you, I think this is unique in Christianity. In other faiths and religions, there is a need to work to become better. Whether through acts of goodness and kindness, whether through pilgrimages, whether through meditation in order to reach a higher um, nirvana or a higher plane of thinking. You work to be good enough in order to access God. To be good enough for God or fill in your blank with whatever it is you need to do enough for God. Only in Christianity do we find a God who loves us so much that he doesn't leave us as we are. He knows how we are and loves us how we are, but because he loves us, he doesn't leave us how we are. He moves into us and enables us to be formed to become like the fullness of Jesus. That's the picture, the transition that happens. The sanctification would be the holy word, um, that we're becoming increasingly holy in our lives, but we become to look more like Jesus. If we follow Paul's prayer here, God gives us the strength, but he also moves in and changes us. For some Christians, and this may apply to you today, you're a Christian, but you're not sure that Jesus dwells in you. I would simply ask you to pray this prayer for yourself today. Maybe ask some Christian friends to pray this, that you would have an increasing awareness that Christ dwells in you. Maybe you need to ask God to confirm that truth in you. Maybe affirm afresh your belief and trust and your following of Jesus. And take God's word as God's word and ask him that you would experience this and know this deep within you. I do want to pause for a, for a moment if you're listening to this book. Uh, because this truth that we find in the Bible is beautiful and wonderful to me. I spent time this week just thinking of, of just the reality of that in my own life. But if you aren't a Christian, it sounds crazy. I have friends who don't have faith and they think this is one of the elements of Christianity that just sounds mad, just to be honest. God moves in, God dwells in you. It's an incredible idea. But if you're not a Christian, you do believe something else. It might be that you're on your own in the world. It might be that you need to make your own luck or that you have the power within you. That's a demanding a belief to have that you have to produce all of this yourself and some um, pin your hope on, on yourself or on somewhere else to find your worth and your meaning. I once had a man tell me that he had his own private secret deal with God and that for him everything was going to be okay. People try to square life in different ways. Maybe if you do good enough in life then God will like you. Or if you give to charity enough God will like you. But I want to say to you gently this morning, who decides what is enough? Who decides that you have done enough? You just sound like you're going to work yourself to the bone. It sounds not quite right that you have to work really hard to get somebody to love you. In Christianity, we are faced with the truth that God is communicating through his words, but in his actions that he loves us. He loves us so much he sends Jesus for us to save us. That's his way of solving the problems of the world. All we have to do is accept that. And when we accept that and believe and trust and follow Jesus, what God says is, I will give you help. 
and the help I give isn't, isn't low-key juniors. God says, I will put my spirit, the spirit of Jesus will move into you. It's incredible good news. I think it's only in Christianity do we find a God who cares enough to do something himself for us, which reveals who he is. He is kind, he is generous, he is loving, he is forgiving, he is better than anything else. I hope you can see that today. I hope you, if you're not a Christian, you can begin to engage with this idea of God is better than anybody else's concept of what they believe um, is in existence. It's a wonderful thing. A God who needs nothing from me, yet still wants me now and forever. God loves you and loves you so much. He doesn't need anything from you. He just wants you who he created and he wants you to be with him now in this life and with you forever. It's a beautifully compelling image of a wonderfully generous, kind God. If you're a visitor this morning or you're watching this online and you don't yet know Jesus, I'm just going to put my cards on the table with you. I want you, whenever we are able to, to come to church. I want you to experience people who are on a similar journey in the sense of they are following Jesus in their lives and as they follow Jesus, Jesus has moved into their lives and they are being changed. That's the heart of the Christian faith. It's the heart of who we are as Christians. We don't always get it right. We're not always perfect. We slip up all the time. But my agenda is to invite you to church as soon as we are open here and we're, we are able to be here. And if you're a follower of Jesus, it's also to get you to come here so we can support and encourage one another and discover more of God's truth and reality in our lives. This is a wonderful, wonderful truth for us to consider, but also to pray for in our own lives and in the lives of those we love. Because we are changed because Christ dwells within us. And so Paul prays that we would have power in our inner life so that Christ would dwell permanently in us. Really, the dynamic that we're seeing here, in this way we become full of Christ over time. He dwells in our hearts through faith. There's a beautiful upward spiral. Our capacity is strengthened according to the riches that God has. God blesses us with this ability to have this. So we appropriate more of the fullness of Jesus in our lives, which then increases our capacity for more of the fullness of Jesus in our lives. And it goes upward and upward and upward with Christ. This prayer for inner strengthening was not a mere wish, but the petition of the Apostle Paul for the church. I'll be clear with you, it is the prayer that I have in my own life. It is my prayer for Glengormley Church family life. And if you're watching this today, it is my prayer that you would know this in your own life. Paul prays for strength. He then prays for love. Notice that he then describes as being rooted and established in love. He mixes his metaphors here because you have rooted, which is the idea of being planted in love. And then established comes from sort of architecture and the idea that your foundations are in love. If we are grounded, planted, founded in love, nothing can shake us. Our relational love is crucial in this new community that Christ forms of church all over the world, globally, but also locally where we find ourselves in the local church family. God puts all of us together because of our faith and trust in Jesus. And in 1 John 4, we are reminded that this love is because he first loved us. So the danger is that we make um, some form of challenge in this, that we must love others but we don't ground ourselves in the fact of we love others because of the experience of love that we have had from Jesus himself. That's very important because otherwise love becomes a duty or something that we are forced to do that you go through the mechanics of when actually we love. You can't force somebody to love you. You can want it, but you can't force it. But whenever we've encountered Christ's love, it changes us and then we love others out of the reality and experience of being loved wholeheartedly and completely by Jesus. The picture we have is of generous, committed love of God for human beings who have the opportunity to respond to him. And when you know and experience that love, it changes us. And then in turn, we love others because we have been changed by a love that we then share to the rest of the world. Church family at its best is ordinary people who have been changed by God's love for them who are so rooted and grounded in God's love that that then breaks out in the world around them and they are able to love others 
with this supernatural love that is beyond comprehension. Because God's love for us is beyond comprehension. Because we all are slightly unlovable. If you live with family, friends, extended family, you have moments where people are hard to love and yet the God of the Bible who made us is saying, but I love you wholeheartedly. And so because we experience that, we are then able to love others in a similar way. What is utterly fabulous here is Paul prays out of this foundation of love that the love would be such that we would grasp further how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. That our knowledge of Christ's love would just grow. Glenda and I are married 16 years this Friday coming. We'd known each other for a few years before we got married. We dated um, for two years and then we got married. And when I was getting married 16 years ago, my experience of love at that point was really grounded in Glenda. That's where it fleshed out. The breadth of it, the height of it, the length of it, the depth of it was really defined in the relationship that I had with Glenda. But 16 years later, in a a bit of life, there's been some incredibly fun and wonderful moments and there have been some really difficult challenges that we have faced in those 16 years. The result of that is that our love has grown. So the love that I had 16 years ago go has grown wider and deeper and longer and wider than it was back then. And I am grateful and I am blessed by it. But I need to be clear with you, Christ's love is so much more than any human love that we see. Christ's love is infinite, it's eternal, it does not get old. But as the old preacher says, God's love is wide enough to embrace the world, long enough to last forever. It is high enough to take us to heaven and deep enough to take Christ to the depths of the lowest sinner. It is all encompassing. Christ's love for you and for me may be incomprehensible and yet Paul's prayer is so that we would be able to know it and we would be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. The third thing is that Paul prays fullness. He prays strength, he prays love and he prays fullness. And the picture we have here is of the church family doing this together being rooted and established in love, we would, as church family, grasp the dimensions of the love of Christ, that we would then be filled by the fullness of God. We would be full with the abundance of God. This is such a wonderful picture. How I think of this in my head is when you're at the beach in the summer and you get sent down with your little bucket to get some water and you you walk in a little bit and you submerge the bucket into the sea and you pull the bucket up And there's a moment where you've just lifted the bucket up and you pause and the water settles. And if you twitch at all, water's tipping out of the bucket. It's so full. It's full in that sense where it's tipping over the top of the bucket by maybe a millimeter of the way that water can hold itself just above the brim. This idea of fullness. What we have here is that we would be filled with the fullness of God, that our lives would be filled to the brim with God. Because... God is like the ocean and you can be submerged and be full and there is more. There is no shortage from God's point of view and you will be full. I'll be honest, I want this for myself. I want this for Glenda. I want it for Lily and Malachi. I want this level of fullness of God in my life for everybody that I love and care about. I want this for the Glengormley Church family. I want the Glengormley Church family to want it for us. And you begin to see the picture of how the local church is praying for the fullness of God for each other. Whether you are the youngest in church and you're probably not even watching this, you're playing on the ground at the minute, or whether you're one of our oldest members in the church family, I want this prayer for you. I want you to know the strength and love and fullness of God. I want us to know that within ourselves as Christ dwells within us. I want that for me and I want that for you. And so this morning I commend this to us that we would put this into practice, that this would become our prayer, that this would be what shapes our prayers for one another and for ourselves and for the wider church family. So let me pray for us now and we'll take God's word at God's word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we are aware that we find our real identity in you. We find who we really are and who we were made to be in relationship with you. And so, Father, we humbly and yet powerfully pray in Jesus' name, 
out of your glorious riches that you would strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being so that Christ would dwell in our hearts. Father, we pray that we would know this, we would know Christ within us, that you would change our appetites and rhythms, that you would give us different desires in our life because we are fully aware of Christ who dwells within us. Father, we pray that we would be rooted, grounded, established in love, that our power in that, together with all of the Glengormley Church family, that we would grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Jesus. That we would be a people who are significantly defined and marked by this. That even the wider community would say, these people are different because they have this love of Jesus. And Father, we pray this love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that we would be filled by this, by your measuring stick, not by ours, that we would be full to the brim of you and of the measure and knowledge of you. Father, we seek to be your people. We ask that you would enable us to pray this consistently for one another and for ourselves that we would know your power and not our power as we go through life. Because we are not powerless. When our trust is in you and we are members of your household and part of your family, your promise is that we can know your power and have your power within us and it changes us. And so we humbly pray, come Holy Spirit, come. Come Lord Jesus, come. Come Father, come. And do your work. Amen. We're going to, to, to praise together. We're going to declare God's glory and greatness and sing where we are. Let's praise God together. i
Let me bless you from the end of Ephesians as we have it. We'll reflect on this briefly tonight. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And I say the grace to one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.